here in Bellingham, Washington. And I'm very grateful to our speakers tonight. That is gonna be Josh Whaley. Josh is a behavioral health consultant. He works at Unity Care Northwest, which as he told me, they see about 10% of our population here in Bellingham. So it is a very busy clinic. Um, he has almost two decades of counseling experience, including crisis intervention and behavioral health consulting. And Josh is primarily interested in reducing the emotional suffering of others through presence and compassion. And from what I understand, he does that very well. Behind me is my cat, Daisy. She loves to join in as well. So Dr. Jenny McLaurin, uh, we went to um, graduate theological school together, but before that, she was actually an MD and still is. She's a board certified pediatrician with over 30 years of healthcare experience serving children, marginalized communities, immigrants, and special needs groups. With additional training in public health, bioethics, and theology, her work includes practicing, writing, teaching, and speaking. She's an expert consultant um, for the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration. She's a medical director of two clinics in Washington State. Some of those clinics are here on our call. Thank you for being here. And she's a writer for the National Association of Community Health Centers and an author of an upcoming book on healing. Woo! Two very cool speakers. Um, and I just want to start out tonight by asking both you, Josh and Jenny, um, kind of what are your, just an opening question, just for a few minutes, what are kind of your, your thoughts and feelings around COVID-19 right now? And it might be more of, you might have more thoughts just on oh my gosh, there's so much practically, or I'm so overwhelmed, or this isn't any big deal. So Josh and Jenny, what are you both just kind of feeling about COVID-19? I am feeling like things are on a roller coaster and they're just changing so quickly in terms of what we're doing in the community and what our response is and um, what people know, what people don't know, what people hold as true, um, the rapidity of this compared to two weeks ago is really striking. And so that's, and that's what hits me as well as um, at this moment in time, a lot of sadness because we've lost a, a friend of ours who's a physician to, to this infection we found out today. So um, a lot of turmoil. I'm feeling a lot of turmoil. I imagine we are probably all going to have personal stories of loss in the midst of this thing, and we haven't even begun to, it, yeah, we're still on the opening edges of this thing, and Jenny, I'm very sorry for the loss that you have heard about today, um, and losing another physician at this period of time, young, too, um, is hard. So thanks for letting us know that that has happened today um, and where some of your, you know, head might be as well. So thanks for that. Um, and Josh, kind of just opening thoughts around uh, your thoughts, feelings around COVID-19. Yeah. Um, some of my thoughts are that, that <clears throat> I would echo what Jenny said, which was, Honestly, until very recently, I don't think I really realized how serious this really is. And so I feel like, um, gosh, I'm kind of shocked by how fast everything has moved. And um, I also have the feeling that I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't think any of us really do. Um, I, think that's, I think this situation is unprecedented, certainly in my lifetime and most people that I know. And... Um, one of the other like pretty loud thoughts is I don't know what's going to come of this whole situation, but I think there's an opportunity for people all over the world to kind of band together and say, Hey, we're all affected by this and we're all in this together. There's a lot of division now. And I think maybe there's an opportunity for coming back together in a big time way. And uh, I think that's worth saying. Cool. And I, I hope we can focus on that a little bit later too, um, that can we find um, hope and positivity in the midst of this, even as we all need to take precautions and learn some more. Um, and Jenny, I just kind of wanted to start out um, with a question for you. 
there's there have been a lot of unknowns with this particular virus like all of a sudden it shows up in December, as, you know, as far as I know, in China, and then it's just kind of spread and there's been lots of disinformation. Kind of what, what are some of the things that, that we do know about this, uh, about the coronavirus that we did not know before? Could, can you just share some of that with us? What we know is it's novel, and that keeps being said, it's novel, which means that it has never been seen in humans before. It's been in animals, but not humans. So at some point, the virus infected a human who, for whatever reason, was susceptible to it. And then it went human to human to human transmission, which is the only way that it's being transmitted right now. It's human to human, not from animals, not from your pets, just human to human. So it's novel because it never existed in human infection before, which means our immune systems have never seen it before. So our immune systems are like newborn babies when it comes to the coronavirus, which is why it's a big deal. When our immune systems haven't even seen a friend of coronavirus, and there's a whole family of them, but the other coronaviruses, the ones that aren't COVID-19, the way it gets called, those don't trigger our immune system the same way this one does. So when you have something that comes to your immune system that triggers in, in an entirely new way, you have no ready defense system. And that's what maybe people didn't know when they said, well, like, why is it such a big deal? Isn't it like the cold or isn't it like the flu? The only like is that it's a virus. And that way it's like it and where it first attacks. It's like a cold or the flu, but otherwise it's not like it at all. It's an entirely different virus and it has its own way of hurting people. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, so I, it, I've seen some people say, oh my gosh, more people have died from the flu. Is it, it can't be as bad as the flu because you know, all of that. What, it, is it worse than the flu? Okay, so that's something that's really changed too. And initially I was in, I was kind of in, in the group that was like, why is everybody so excited about this and they won't get a flu vaccine? Like get a flu vaccine, hello. It's true, 61,000 people died in the US last year from the flu. At first we thought that COVID-19, this virus, was less contagious than the flu. But now we know that's not true. It's more contagious. At first, we thought that the flu and COVID-19 were about the same in terms of seriousness, but now we know that's not true. This is 10 times more deadly than influenza flu. So now we know it's more contagious and it's more deadly by a factor of 10. And we know that the deadly part is age related so and immune related but age related so that if you're a small child you might get a little tiny infection that maybe nobody's even going to notice but you're still contagious but you're not going to die or get sick unless there's something wrong with your immune system but the older you get the less your body is able to fight it and the higher the chance is that you will not do well so, so misinformation was that children don't get it. Children do get it. And that's why we're closing schools because children get it everywhere and they spread it everywhere, but we don't even know they have it half the time. So they're sort of silent vectors where they're cheerily, happily with little cherub faces, passing it all over the place. And you don't even know that you've, you've gotten it. So, the whole um the method by transmission we know we're supposed to be washing hands and i'm sure everyone on this call has been doing lots and lots of hand washing um originally i had read about it being um in the air like around infected people and all that we, we breathe it out and all that type of stuff what what how exactly is the contagion spread okay so that's another thing that keeps changing and you keep hearing okay. lots of different things about it okay so different from measles, which if I just breathe and I have measles, just my breath 
will infect 90% of the people in the same room for most of the day who haven't had measles. The way COVID-19 seems to spread is that it's droplets. So it's not just my breath. It's not because there aren't little droplets. So there has to be little droplets. And those droplets either are in the lining of my nose, in the mucus of my mouth, in the mucus of my eyes, the, that sticky stuff, that would be enough to be droplets. Um, or if I sneeze, or if I cough, there will be droplets. Those droplets go up in the air. So theoretically it's respiratory spread if those droplets get spread to me, you know, within three to six feet of somebody sneezing. But otherwise those droplets land on a surface. They land on my coat, they land on a table, and then somebody else touches that surface with their fingers and then rubs their eye or their nose or their mouth with those fingers. That's how they get it. So the droplets have to make their way to mucous membranes like eye, nose, mouth, or um, they have to be directly sneezed into you. So the only way they can make it to your face is through your hands or somebody else's hands or somebody sneezing. Okay. Yeah, it, it makes total sense. And I've read different things about how, when it gets onto surfaces, how long does this thing last? Right, so we see people said nine days. I heard that multiple times, nine days. Then I heard recently that they'd actually done um, testing in a lab and it was three days, 72 hours. And those were under controlled conditions where there wasn't wind and it was the right temperature and all that. So the feeling is, this is something we don't know for sure. How long does it last? How long does it last in the air in a droplet up to three hours before the droplet hits something solid? Once it hits something solid, how long can it live without being inside a human being? The best guess is around three days. Um, so you want to wash surfaces and anything that's been touched minimally every three days, optimally every day, and then also in between people, in between touches. So if you haven't touched something for a whole day, but you think that people might have trafficked in and out, you wash that surface. Okay, T two more things about just specific knowledge about, about this particular contagion. Um, if, so what, what's the time length that we're looking at? Let's say you touch something that has the contagion on it and you forget because it's so hard not to touch your face and uh, you do, you don't know you've done this and it gets in through your eye, let's say. When, when do you become contagious and when would you potentially start feeling symptoms if you are going to experience symptoms? Okay, that's a great question. Let's say it got in through your nose because that's a little easier to be more definitive about. So the virus, as soon as it has a nice warm place to replicate and, and the right conditions, um, it replicates. So it has a protein shell and then it has DNA inside and that protein shell breaks and the DNA reproduces. That happens fast. So as soon as it's in you, it's gonna start replicating, but it's a brand new novel virus in you. So your body doesn't know that anything's wrong yet. Your body hasn't recognized it from the past. It goes, I've never seen this thing before. I don't really know if it's a problem. So it's replicating along. You don't have a fever yet because your body's not, not upset about it, but it's replicating. So it is already shedding. It's So you will cough it, you will spit it, you will have it in your, in your membranes as soon as it can replicate enough to get to a critical mass. So if it first gets in your nose, it's not gonna immediately be in your eyes, but it's not gonna take very long. And it might take your body up to five days or so, we're still not sure on that timing, to even have a fever, to even say, I'm gonna now make an immune response to this thing that is now multiplying, multiplying, multiplying inside my body. Because at first your body, it needs a lot of time with a, something new to make an immune response to it. 
since it's never seen it before. So that's part of the, the problem with this is people are asymptomatic potentially for, I don't know the reality of how long, but the average, they're saying the average is five days. So that on average people will be walking around as breeders of this, of this illness, but not know it for five days. So um, that's really, that's a little scary because typically you think I've got, when I've got a cold, it's only when I'm, con I'm only contagious when I'm actually feeling really sick, you know? So that, that's what I've always been told about, say, the common cold. If you're, when you're snotty and all that, that's when you're contagious. But you're saying no, pretty much really quickly after you pick up a contagion, because it starts in these areas, it's going to be replicating there and you're going to be sloughing those off just as a normal part of daily life pretty quickly. So. Yeah, yeah, you will before you realize that you don't even feel good. And that's my problem with people who get on the news and say, it's mild. I, I feel great. No, they, they will have just been diagnosed maybe two days ago and they're a celebrity and they're being called on and they're going, oh, I feel great. Right. Well, the way this thing works is... Um, for those that end up desperately ill with it, they're not exactly, sure. the timing isn't consistent, but many people just have the infection in their head and neck and it doesn't go to their lungs and that's all they get. But when it goes to your lungs, which is later in the infection, it's really rapid and really severe. And so that's, that's the part where it, it doesn't really help for people to say, oh, I feel great, you know, because they're going to feel great until they don't feel great. And we don't know which group isn't going to feel great. We know the risk group. But when, when it suddenly goes down into your lungs, it's devastating and it's rapid. And, and that's the other hard thing about this, which is different than the flu. The flu kind of goes to your lungs a little bit at a time and you have a cough and you get pneumonia and we watch it and we say, yeah, you got a little pneumonia, but you know, we can take care of you as an outpatient right now. That does not happen with this. This is a devastating pulmonary overload when it happens with zero defense. So that's very, very different than what we're used to. Okay, thanks. Um, and um, I was given a question, a really good one, actually. It, it, one last one. And then I want to get to Josh just to talk about um, kind of, how this whole thing is creating trauma, because <laughs> I want, want to be able to talk about that too. Um, but just a, a general contagion question, what about our mail? You know, what about things that come to our house and all of that? I mean, can, can you, you know, like, does contagion exist on things like that? That's a good question. I know they said for us not to lick our ballots in Washington, which I thought was absurd because it, it like sticks it all together. So it's not gonna droplet out anywhere. It's all stuck onto the glue if it's there at all, but- um, And Virginia, probably, and probably like, dead. But um, in terms of your mail, uh, I don't, so this is me, but I would, um, I don't trust anybody else's hands right now. So I would basically, um, quick wipe off with a wipe, anything that you're getting from somebody else or pure, you know, Purell your hands, rub it over the mail and then open the mail. But I, I'm, I, I don't, I don't trust other people's hands right now. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for all of that. Um, and that's a lot of information and it's a lot of stuff that I did not know, which I'm really grateful, Jenny, that you are willing to kind of just share your medical knowledge with us. Um, and you work in health clinics, so this is kind of a big deal for you to be, you know, on top of this thing to be able to tell all the folks in the health clinics that you're working with. Um, Josh, this is kind of a lot of stuff, and you know, and you and I both have asthma, and I hear that it's going to go right into your lungs, and it's going to be horrible. And I'm yeah, like, yeah, I wasn't ah. very comforting. Sorry. Yeah, that no, it does. This is, doesn't have to be comforting. That's that's not quite the point of what we want to do here today. Not that we want to develop hysteria. But still, um, to be a little bit realistic about it. And Josh and I had talked about, you know, he's got asthma, I've got asthma. And I'm like, crap, that would suck if, you know, we end up getting this thing. 
because it's so devastating on the respiratory system. And just the thought of anybody getting it is stressful and family members getting it. I had a trip down to my parents. Uh, I was supposed to do this last weekend for my mom's birthday and it was really hard on me to say, no, we're not gonna go. They're very much in a vulnerable category and it's not a good idea for us to go and it was hard. Um, and the concern is, are my parents gonna get it? Or if they do, I don't know that they'll survive this thing. And there's just stress. And Josh, you work um, in stressful situations. That tends to be what you address. Um, yep. Special type of person, I think, to do that. Um, I was, you have um, worked a lot and, and um, had a lot of influential words around vicarious trauma, but that isn't exactly what this is. I, I my thought was, it, is this something called collective trauma? Is this like a trauma that everyone is experiencing at the same time? What, yes. What, what do you kind of say about that? Yes. So um, vicarious trauma really refers to being witness to other people's trauma and the effect that that has on everyone around them to one degree or another. But collective trauma is a different thing. That's where we're all experiencing, probably everyone in the world who knows about this is experiencing um, significant anxiety about it. So in that way, it's definitely a collective trauma to everybody. And it's different than vicarious because it directly impacts all of us. How, how, how would you define trauma? And I, I mean, we both have, I mean, all of us are going to have an idea of what trauma is. Just from your perspective, can you give us just a little yeah. bit of a definition of that? Sure can. Um, there's probably better ones out there, but I would say, um, sorry, cat's getting in my way. Uh, unwanted injury, psychological, physical, emotionally, spiritually. So trauma is a a wide definition, but it's, I would say that the, the basic uh, thought is unwanted injury. And I think that um, you could apply that to a lot of different things, but yeah, obviously we're all worried about our physical health. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of, like, what, what kind of effect does, can collective trauma have on a society? You know, you, you, everyone's experiencing trauma at the same time. Um, mm -hmm to different levels, what kind of effect does that just have on a community and on a society? Well, I mean, I think we're all sort of viewing each other as though there's, we're sick, as though all of us are sick. So we're probably more vigilant about anyone who shows signs of a cold, which really wouldn't cause much concern, typically. I think we're all much more vigilant than we were. Um, we could be more, we could, be more vulnerable to um, ang more anxiety and stress in our daily lives because we're worrying about this all the time. So I would say that uh, we're probably more hypervigilant than normal as a collective, and we're probably a lot more worried as a collective. And with, with all that stress, what, what kind of toll does that just take on us? Um, in, in various ways? Uh, well, I would say, you know, for myself, it's kind of emotionally tiring. As I, as I listen to all this information that comes in, as the days go on, um, it's getting more and more concerning. So I would say for myself, um, I feel a bit worn out as the days go on. I would imagine other people do too. Yeah. So yeah, there's a jump in on that one. Yeah, so, Cause I told Sheris, a friend of mine posted, who's a physician that he's cycling rapid cycling between grief and anger. And I think I would say the same thing for me, grief, anger, and um, worry, those three. And it's hard and it's hard. Like for Josh and me, we have to be very, um, professional and stuff when we are work or even on this webcast I'm trying to be just kind of direct but but there's a lot of weighty emotion behind all of it yeah there is I mean I'm I'm probably going to go in tomorrow I'm not entirely sure about that and uh, I'm I guess I'm going to assume as though myself and all of my patients and all my colleagues are infected 
which I, I wish I had a sunnier message for you all and, and, uh, and tell you I'm not worried about it, but that just wouldn't be true. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, Jenny, if we're being, you know, you just given it to us like it is, how drastic are we supposed to be with isolation just in, in this contagion trying to get a handle on it? Okay, and um, I did make a long list of things for Sheriff's that I shared, and so I'm taking longer to say them than I did to write them. But um, did you say how long should we socially isolate? Or no, what? just how, how drastic should we, we oh, be? Oh, well, yeah. I'm really glad that the latest thing that came out was like five people or, or fewer. So here's the thing on social isolation. I've gotten lots of questions about children and play dates and people wanting to hire babysitters and then little neighborhood groups popping up on how they can all help each other. The thing about social isolation is it doesn't work if you don't stick with the same little group for the whole period of social isolation. So if you're gonna soci socially isolate with three other little friends with your four-year-old and your eight-year-old, um, and then those three friends and you are gonna go somewhere else tomorrow with some other group, um, not with each other, but with, you know, you're gonna go over with three other people you're not socially isolating because all you're doing is making sure that your little group that you're with on Monday all gets it when one of you from that group goes somewhere else on Tuesday. Um, they're making sure that not just that one person on Tuesday gets it who gets infected, but that they're going to bring it back to all of you. So the idea of social isolation, stick with your same little club. You're in a click. You're in a click for a month or two. And you need to you need to stick with the same people, and they need to not go anywhere that you don't go. You know, you basically you see what I'm saying. Like I can go by myself to the grocery store, or whatever. But if I plan on getting together with just a few little friends, they need to be the same ones for that month. I can't kind of mix and match my groups. Right. So it doesn't matter so much that you're not meeting in groups of more than ten. You just need to stay with the same group and have it be the same small. under 10. Yeah. So you can't bounce around or you're just making a bigger ball that's bouncing around in the infection world. Yeah. Um, with a bunch of other big balls that are bouncing around, but they're still bouncing around. So um, it doesn't help. It doesn't help to be in groups of 10 that are still mobile. Right. And it's probably not helpful to be in a group of 10 because the 10 is too big anyway. You were saying five is what you've read. Well, five is what's being recommended now, which I think is a good idea. Basically, okay. the very best idea would be to shelter in place, as they say, like they're saying in the Bay Area in California. But we're already so behind. We would have to do that in Washington for six weeks. Wow. To really make that curve. And people are still going to get this in the future even after we finish all of this, it's just that we're trying to make it take longer for it to finish. It's, we're not gonna be able to stop it. We've, we've missed that, that point. So now it is going to spread and most of us are going to be exposed to it probably. We're gonna to try to keep our high risk people from getting it. But in order to get that number of people in the population who've had it and yet protect the vulnerable, it's going to take a long, long time um, before we're done. Yeah. So social isolation is, is such a uh, social distancing is such a difficult thing because we need people as well. And sometimes being online is, is one way to be able to handle it. And we're so lucky that we've got um, the modes of communication that we do now. Um, but what I hear you saying is if, if you're going to choose to stay in physical contact or at least um, actual proximity to another human being, even if it's going to be six feet, that you really need to, to just lock that down to no more than a very small group of people, say five. And th those are the people. You, you don't go hanging out with other groups of five. It's just one group of five. 
that would be my recommendation. Okay. Right. And I think I said in my note to you, like, you can go fly kites or something, go do something outside or go on a hike, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, but when we're talking about indoor spaces in particular, being in a room together, you really want to not be mixing and matching who you're doing that with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Echoes does have a few things that are on the calendar coming up and they are, if they're not online, they're outside. <laughs> Just like we're going to stay our distance, we're going to be outside and we're going to do, we're going to do something that's in, not an enclosed space and we're not going to be touching the same things. So, and, or each other. <laughs> no, stop touching me. Um, so I uh, got a question that, that came in. Um, it can Basically, I'm going to boil it down. Can we be reinfected? What happens if you get it and um, you are able to recover from it? Are you immune or not? Uh, okay, that one is I absolutely know the answer to and it's it's actually an easy answer. Yes, you can get it more than once. Um, and the reason you can is again, it's a novel virus and your immune system, maybe the first time you got it, which is true with most things actually, maybe the first thing you got it, you didn't mount a really great immune response to it for whatever reason, you might not have gotten much of the virus or maybe your immune system was a little wacky or whatever. So you didn't have come up with a good antibody response. If you don't have an antibody response and the same infection comes at you again, you will get it again which is why we give multiple vaccine series to kids when they're little, because they don't always get a good antibody response to their vaccine. So we give it again to get another antibody response to it. Right. So yes, you can get it again and you'll be contagious again. Wow, that's really chipper. Usually when we get something twice, it's not as severe the second time, because usually we have a little bit of a response from okay. before. Wow, with all this chipper stuff, let's talk to Josh. Um, Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Josh, what, what do we do? What do we do with all this? How do we deal with this emotional insanity of like, I cannot believe this is actually happening in the world. And, um, and we don't have a treatment for it. Like if you're sick with it, you just have to get over it. Um, and what what do you what what do we do emotionally? How do we how do we um, kind of bear with this collective trauma that we're all having? Well, I would say moment by moment and breath by breath. I mean, things are changing day to day, and I think being really flexible, um, kind of riding the wave, if you will. I think that's important, and I do think that when we're, so many people are practicing social distancing so that we have less infected folks, I think that the fact that we have all these electronic mediums like Zoom and Facebook and all this kind of stuff, FaceTime and all these ways to interact with each other, even when we're isolated physically, I think that sort of helps a bit because at, you know, once you're, let's say somebody isolates themselves for 15 days, by the time you get to that 15th day, most of us are going to want to see people and talk to people. It's a natural urge. Not for everybody, but most of us. <laughs> and so I think that um, it's also helpful what Jenny was saying is like, if you have a little crew that you're around a lot, that's who you should be around. It's not like you can never see anyone or never spend any time with anybody. Because um, I think we're going to still need to connect with each other. Um, just not in the same way for a while until things settle down. Yeah. I've seen um, videos of, uh, this was granted a few weeks ago, fights of, uh, of fights between people over items in a grocery store, i.e. famously fighting over toilet paper. Um, and I know for me, even just a week ago, having a pretty short temper with people that I work with. Um, have, have you been experiencing just kind of, just not quite altogether on your game? Is, is that? Yeah, yes. Uh, I would say um, that for me on Friday, 
when I was in my clinic, um, and I'm speaking personally for myself, I'm not representing my clinic really at all. Um, but what I noticed is we have these gatherings and they're called huddles. And after I went to the fourth one, it was very clear that every single person in the huddles, in the meetings, was concerned and worried. Everyone was fearful. And it occurred to me that we don't really know what's happening. And we don't really know what we're doing, really. So that's, that was difficult. And I noticed that when I wasn't with patients, not doing what I always do, I definitely felt more irritated and it took me a minute to realize why um, because it became clear to me that I was worrying about we don't know what we're dealing with here and for myself in a community health center I'm along with other people I'm on the front lines and I'm going to see a lot of people who are sick and it started to occur to me that maybe I was bringing home the virus and not showing symptoms and maybe giving it to people that I live with and not knowing that. So I would say Friday was definitely a turning point where I was like, hmm, yep, my usual coping skills aren't working. Better talk it out kind of thing. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. And um, I, um, am I, I'm not on mute, right? I um, find myself very irritable with people in my personal circle where I can be very professional with people in my work world. But the minute I hear somebody complain about missing spring break or not getting to do a college tour or um, whatever plan, you know, the bars are closed. It's just like, I just want to scream. It's like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, that's not a big problem. But then I thought, you know, a therapist, Josh, told me once that when I said, well, my problem wouldn't make front page news, he said, it makes front page news on your newspaper. And, um, and that was really good, which meant it was important in my life. And so I told another friend, give yourself a little bit of time every day to be upset and to scream and yell about everything that's going wrong and what got canceled and all the losses, because they're real losses. These are losses that people are experiencing and um, and then move on. I don't know whether you agree with that, Josh, but that's what I do. It's just like, get it all out, wail if you want to, and then regroup and go forward. Oh yeah, I would agree with that because one of the worst things we can do for ourselves is suppress our emotions and act like they're not there, which, we're actually pretty good at in America, unless the emotions are happiness or anger. Um, we usually suppress emotions of anxiety and sadness. So I would say allowing yourself to experience what you're experiencing is useful because that is not typically how we deal with emotions. And how, and when we suppress emotions, they come out sideways in um, physical ailments that can't be explained, right, Jenny? They hurt and, your immune um, system. Stress hurts your immune system, and we all want really good immune systems right now. So try not to bring your stress onto others. Try to acknowledge your stress. Try to laugh, right, Josh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Humor. You, you still want to get out and do things. I mean, you, it's good to go out and walk. It's good to go on bike rides. It's good to hike. It's good to get exercise right now. Maybe not in a gym. <laughs> so with, with this acknowledgement that none of us probably are really kind of, as I, as I had said earlier, my own words, just nobody's really quite on their game right now. Um, and somehow I'm not on my game. Others aren't on their game. And so the possibility for conflict, the possibility for... Um, irritability, the possibility for just flare-ups is probably increased. So the challenge, I think, for us is to figure out how to offer compassion when we may not even feel like we want to offer compassion because we're like, ah! Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that we need to keep in our forefront is 
everybody is going through a lot of stress and it's affecting everybody. And therefore, how do we improve our compassion work? You know, how do we, how do, we do that? Um, and that's something I think for, for groups of people to kind of discuss maybe, you know, after this on their own with, with your people, how do I live a life that is going to be more compassionate at this period of time so that we're not um, actively building into the collective trauma and the collective stress that we find ourselves in the midst of right now. So big, big questions. Um, and I want to be able to open it up to some questions to folks. Josh and Jenny, do either of you have any things that you would like to say before we open it up to some verbal questions? Well, I just had given Shira's this long <laughs> written piece of paper with my <laughs> notes on it. So if anybody feels like they wanted more details that they didn't get, be happy to share it. Yeah, just contact uh, Echoes through our website or through Facebook and, and we can get you Jenny's notes. That'd be great. But any, any I would say, thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. I do have some thoughts on this. I think that if we can, um, for some of us, it helps to be compassionate to ourselves and that allows us to be compassionate towards others. And for other people, they have to be compassionate to someone else before they can be compassionate to themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think being aware of how much emotional gas in the tank we have is important. Um, but sometimes reaching out to other people and checking in with them, asking them how they're doing um, with genuine interest um, and presence. Being compassionate to others helps us be compassionate to ourselves and the other way around. Good so one. I think that's really important to say. Thank you. Thank you. And I've got one question to start us off with. And then if, if you have, once, uh, once this one gets answered, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself just to ask the question, just unmute it, ask the question, and then go ahead and hit mute again. And then we'll um, have our panelists speak to that. Um, but one question that came in was just, how does all of this work with going to the grocery store? I guess that is that for me? I think it could be for both of you because sometimes so in some <laughs> in some countries they're actually having the elderly go for the first two hours of the day to any kind of shopping pharmacies grocery stores I think that's a great idea um, I think as much as possible if we can do one shop and be done right like plan ahead so you're not going every day so you want to minimize your trips if you can do it with your little group of five. If you guys wanna split up your errands and do them all as one big errand, that's a possibility. We have a neighbor in her 70s. We told her that we would just do her shopping with our shopping. So, you know, trying to collaborate as much as possible and then help those who are more frail shop for them. You can do it without being a hoarder. If you have those blue gloves, or even if you have um, gloves that you wear in the winter, it doesn't matter. If you wear gloves when you're going to a grocery store and you're gonna pick up fruit that somebody has hand put out and hand put out on displays, wear your gloves, wash them when you get home. There you go. Your hands won't, aren't gonna get dirty. So just think about that. I pick up a paper napkin when I was traveling for work last week and I was at a hotel where they served food and I picked up a paper napkin and I used it as my grip with the ladles and with the different things and I threw it away when I was done. So um, try, to, try to have something besides your hand touch things, whether that's a glove or a napkin or whatever. Thanks. All right, let's say, uh, does anyone else have a question? You can just unmute yourself just briefly and ask away. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Rosie. So, um, so I hear that with the flu, there is this, this concept of different waves of the illness. So the first wave of the Spanish flu in, in 1918 killed a certain number of people, and then it died down, but then it came back again in the fall, and it was worse. Can you explain that phenomenon, Jenny, and is that do we uh, do doctors think that that's how the COVID-19 epidemic pa pandemic is going to behave? Okay, there's um, we're not sure how the how the COVID is going to behave, but 
Um, every year, the flu virus, of course, mutates, right? And we know that COVID has already mutated a little bit, and we expect it to mutate a lot more. So when it mutates, it can be either not as serious or more serious. We, you don't know when something mutates, whether it's going to be more, um, cause more problems or less. What we do know is that once we've seen something once, if it doesn't mutate so much that it looks totally foreign, we will have a quicker antibody response to it. So that's the good news. And that Spanish flu, that's second wave, it was also that people weren't, um, didn't have any immunity from the first time around. So it was a more serious strain and it got people that, that didn't have, uh, some sort of residual protection from the first wave. Right now, we don't really know if this is gonna be seasonal. Nobody knows. People are saying it as if it's the flu, but it's not. And the, the scientists are saying, we don't know the seasonality of this yet. All we know is it's a pandemic. And eventually it will die down. And eventually it will probably come back with mutated forms. It may be something that just like we change the flu vaccine every year and we sort of guess on the mutated forms that that's what we'll do with the vaccine with this, but no one really knows those answers yet. Thank you. Anyone else have a question for Josh and Jenny? If you do just unmute briefly, ask the question and then mute again. Okay, or, it's Nat. Go ahead. I got a question about um you know is there is it reasonable to expect that we might get an antibody test because it seems to me that people who become immune with a significant bout of this could be in a good position to be helpers to others nat that is a great question and i so wish that we had that now um i wonder how many people have already had this and don't even know it um I also am beyond upset. I'm trying to say this without being too emotional, but I'm so upset that we're not just doing surveillance where we had enough swabs to see everybody and who has it and who doesn't and kind of know what our ground game is because we don't. Um, so yes, there will be an, an antibody test eventually, but like even with influenza, we rarely ever do that. We do it after things like um, measles vaccine to make sure that you've got antibodies. So part of that will depend on the cost and it will depend on whether whoever wants to develop it thinks that it's worth it. So could we? Yes, we could. Will we? I don't know. Would it be helpful? Yes, it would be helpful. There's a lot of things that could be helpful that we have not managed to do. <laughs> right. So, if, yeah. if we had swabbed everybody like South Korea, that's why their death rates 1% instead of 3%, which is ours is about 5%. That's why, because they swabbed everybody and they isolated immediately and they didn't wait um, until there was a big outbreak in a certain region to have social isolation. They just, they did it all, all at once. Anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Yeah. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so what do we do with the people in assisted living? Um, we can't go in to see them and we shouldn't be going in to see them. But in the reality, um, they, need, they need something. But how do, we, how do we keep in contact with them in a way that, that we're not putting them at greater risk? Also a great question. Um, I don't know if you're talking about somebody you personally know or people in general in, in assisted living, but Mar for, people no, I, in for context, Marjorie's a pastor. So okay. you know, there's quite a few folks that she's looking after. Yeah, and then I guess that gets into, um, can you do pastoral care, pastoral visits? And I don't know what the rules on that are. Um, I think it'd be really sad if you couldn't, but I don't know. The don't reality know. is that unless it's end of life, no. Okay. So um, I don't know how many of those folks 
have the ability to use something like an iPad, but um, even if there were medical assistants in the assisted living that would walk around and connect them to you, for instance, so that you could see them like I see you now, and you do some sort of care. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer for that other than write all the cards we can and have kids send in paintings and pictures and flowers and stuff like that. But I, I, I don't have a good answer outside the use of technology. Josh, have you got any thoughts on that? I was just gonna say, I agree with Jenny. I mean, when we talk about pastoral visits to assisted living facilities, you know, I don't know. I mean, until things settle down, I think this whole virus kind of changes the narrative of how we, how we visit with people um, so that we can still connect with them spiritually, emotionally, but not necessarily spread the virus too. So I, you know, I, I don't know that there are great answers, but I'm grateful that we have the kind of technology we have now because we can connect with people in ways that seem like science fiction, you know, 10, 15 years ago. All right. I had a question come in. Are there any reliable tests available that we can purchase online? No. Yeah. Full that stop. Cool. Nor are there any cures. Yeah. Any other questions? You can write Beware, them, write snake them. oil salesman. Yeah. 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 Danielle, um, do you have a question down there? Yeah. Um, um, thank you for meeting with us, first of all. And um, a couple questions. One, my dad said that he heard that the virus can survive on clothing. And I was wondering if you've heard anything about that. Just wondering how vigilant we need to be in terms of like washing clothes and so uh, yeah it can live on clothing it can live on any kind of surface for up to three days okay. so that's why doctors theoretically wear white coats back in the old days in the times of infectious diseases and why the men doctors had bow ties is because they didn't want any contagion on oh. their clothing and so the idea was that you would take your white coat off at the hospital and have it washed and wear a different one, you know, the next day. Nobody does it anymore. But that is why it was done. So, yes, um, your clothing can have contagion on it. So another trick might be wear the same coat when you go out all the time. Don't swap around a bunch of sweaters and stuff as your outerwear if you're going somewhere like the grocery store. And then have it be easily washed. Um, so pick something simple. Um, okay. you want to look ridiculous, you can cut a black trash bag and make it a poncho and then, you know, throw it away. But yes, that would make sense because that's exactly what infectious disease people do. Wow. Um, my second question is, you mentioned earlier that if it's mild, um, it could just be kind of like in your head and your throat and just wondering what those symptoms would look like because I've been what I think just battling a head cold um the last several days and I don't have a fever or anything like that I just yeah. feel really congested and like kind of swollen glands and mucus yeah. and stuff like that so there's some really good um graphs out there on on looking at allergies flu and COVID and the thing with flu and COVID is you have a fever. A fever eventually is part of, especially in an adult would be, you know, if you're worried about it. Um, so fever, when, fever and then your upper respiratory stuff is um, a cough and it's usually a dry cough. So they're finding that the congestion isn't very much with people who have it. So when they have mild disease, it might be a headache and a little bit of elevated temperature and maybe a tiny bit of a cough or a sore throat. So it doesn't get that full head sinusy stuff that other viruses give you. So you should feel pretty good if you have a full head sinusy thing. Um, and then knowing that it's not allergy, you know, allergies have no fever and also have the full head thing. So that's 
That's the difference. But again, they're not testing people until, and this is sad to me, one of the things was unless you're turning blue or have chest pain or can't breathe. So if you call your emergency department or hospital or doctor right now, you, even if you have known asthma and you know, all of that, they're not gonna test you unless you're very much farther down the road, which is why we have to take care of everybody. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that Josh and I had talked about was the exacerbation of those with mental health struggles um, probably uh, can have, you know, exacerbation of that and folks who have not had mental health struggles that they can identify previously now might be popping up. Josh, what, what do we do um, in just cases where someone needs some right now, some, you know, mental health relief? Yeah, I mean, I would say that the best uh, thing to do is refer them to crisis line. Um, that's something that can be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, the crisis line number is the same uh, for Whatcom County as it is for Skagit. Um, I can't speak to um, other counties right offhand. And uh, actually, I can take a second and just make sure I have that pulled up. If well. you Google it, what are you, what are you looking for? Do you just type in crisis line? Crisis your... line, Whatcom <laughs> County. Okay. All right. And if you're somewhere else in the country, I imagine crisis line in your zip code or, you know, yep. something like It'll that. It'll come right up there in every, every single community in the U S. And what happens when someone calls a crisis line? What happens? In the midst of that? So they do everything from supportive listening, um, which is really just listening and understanding um, to, you know, trained volunteers who offer some, you know, practical strategies all the way to mobile crisis outreach team who can, who are trained behavioral health crisis intervention specialists who can go see people in the community who need it. Is your workplace going to know if you call a crisis line? Is it going to be on record? No. Anymore? No. Okay. So, so well, I have another thing is some people have asked if, they should um, call in sick just because they're afraid and they don't think their workplace is taking enough action and they're having a lot of anxiety. And to me, if you're having a lot of anxiety, you, you are sick in a way. Josh, I don't know what you think about that, but, but where it was ramping up and getting higher and higher anxiety with the thought of going to work, I, I was a fan of them staying home. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is an unusual situation. And, you know, when you when you think about um, trying to do a job well, and you're doing your job with a lot of fear and worry and anxiety, it's hard to do it effectively. And so, <laughs> because I'm a behavioral health provider, and I've always encouraged people to face things they're afraid of, um, typically, I would tell people to go towards the anxiety, but in <laughs> of COVID, I would say no. If you're worried about getting sick and you don't feel comfortable going to work, you should tell your supervisor how you're doing and make a decision. It's, it's not an easy thing. And I, I don't know that there's any simple answers, but these are unprecedented times. And I think we have to acknowledge that anxiety is higher everywhere. And I would also say that typically in America, when people are anxious, or sad or scared, their typical behavior is to suppress it and act like it's not there, which makes it worse. So these are different times, and I'm gonna contradict my usual narrative, which is if you're afraid of getting sick and you think going to work may get you ill, maybe you should stay home for a while. I'm not any kind of authority on this, but I don't know what Jenny thinks, but that's my opinion. No, that is what I think. And I was going to say, maybe because I'm a pediatrician, I want to nurture, I tell them to stay home. But yeah, I think they should stay home. And I, I also think it's a time not to be angry at people if you think they're not doing their job. Because um, I told folks, I'll be a medical assistant if that's what you need me to be down at one of my clinics, because the medical assistants are high risk. 
and they don't want to be at work. And I said, I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. I'm not going to worry about my title. And other people were all into, well, I didn't get trained to do that. And it's like, you know what, this is a different time. And right now we should do what we're good at doing, how we can be helpful and positive and try to let the part that's just going to be depleting get put aside. And there's also the, the thought, as someone has mentioned to me, that for some staying home with no or to little, little to no resources can create its own anxiety, particularly oh, yeah. if you've got kids and, yeah. you know, and, you know, other family dynamics that are extraordinarily challenging that you're avoiding a particular anxiety at work, but then you end up with a different form, but maybe possibly as much anxiety at home. So it's another oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt there. I agree. I mean, <laughs> now you have now you have situations where employees have kids home from school, home from daycare. Some people's jobs are are closed right now. So you know this is having huge, huge economic impact too. And I mean, I don't know what the school systems are going to do, but they mean they may need to go virtual for a while. Um, I really, I keep saying it, I really think this virus changes the narrative as far as how we deal with daily life and what we do with our time. Um, yeah. So even possibly, I mean, some folks are going to have a therapist that they can talk with. Um, it's probably helpful for um, most people to at least have one or two other folks that they can talk with about how they're actually doing. Um, how are you really doing? I would imagine Josh would probably say that's a good idea. I would. There's nothing better than natural supports. And um, by natural supports, I mean like your family, people that you're friends with, your neighbor, people that you can confide in and talk to when you're feeling stressed. Um, that's very, very helpful because even though there's therapists out there and they're certainly busy, most of us will not see one in our lifetimes. Only one out of 10. That may go up with this situation, but I really encourage people to lean on um, natural supports like friends, family, folks in your church, people that you trust, people that you love. The other thing I'd say, Josh, about not seeing a therapist as somebody who's really enjoyed seeing a therapist is that um, it costs money. And as everybody has is losing money right now and losing jobs and not having discretionary income, they are gonna need their their friends and support people. For sure. I, um, I, want, I want to let people know that um, this was, we thought we were just going to go to about 7.30. It's now 7.40. And if oh. you need to go, feel free. We are recording this. Um, we're hoping it's recording. This is the first time we've done this. So we hope it's recording. And if it is successfully recording, we will be putting this um, online for you to be able to access later. So if you've got things to do, feel free to head off. I do have one other question that was sent in. We know there's no cure. There's not a cure. But for people who do end up in respiratory distress, what is happening uh, for them to try and relieve that respiratory distress? Okay, that's a good question. And that is part of why we're not, why everybody who comes in doesn't get swabbed if you're symptomatic. Um, because um, it doesn't change your treatment. So if, if you have this, it has a natural progression and it's most of the time, it's gonna go away by itself and it will be mild. And then some of the time it will be a little bit less mild, um, but still, sorry, my computer's doing things in front of me, but, um, you know, it'll bother you, but it's not gonna put you in the hospital. If you get sick enough where you are having respiratory distress, then we can support you and support you with oxygen. Um, if you really are in bad respiratory distress, support you with being intubated or having a CPAP um, pressure uh, oxygen delivery. 
getting IV fluids because if you're breathing really hard and coughing a lot, you can't eat or swallow. Um, don't want you to aspirate. So you get your nutrition and your fluids through veins and you get oxygen um, support and you get pressured oxygen if your lungs need it. The extreme of that is called ECMO and it's when you actually get on a heart lung bypass because your lungs have failed. You can be on that for a little while and hopefully your lungs will start healing, but it just depends on whether your lungs can heal by themselves if the viral load can go down and start disappearing. Um, and if we can support your body well enough in that time. So we could take care of all of your organs in an ICU. We can take care of your kidneys and do dialysis. We can take care of your lungs, your heart. But at some point your body's got to kick back in and that is usually like within a week, your body has to kick back in. So that's the, you know, again, it's the bad news, but the good news is there's, there's a lot that our technology can do. We can't cure you, but there's a lot of support that we can give to you, but we can't give the support when you don't need the support, which is why everybody doesn't get hospitalized or observed. All right, okay. Thank you. And we have time for another question. Does anyone have um, one yeah. final question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got one, Charles. This for, for Josh, you talked earlier about um, kind of the, the collective trauma that we're all experiencing, sort of witnessing the, the health sides of this. You also sort of briefly touched on, I think you called it voyeuristic trauma, where you're like witnessing others in trauma. And that mm -hmm. rung true for me as something that I'm experiencing from the like economic impacts of this as someone that, you know, has the ability to work from home and is fairly immune to the, the layoffs and the economic slowdown caused by this. Um, but, but it sort of rang true for me as something that I'm experiencing for my friends and family that maybe work in the service yeah. industry and, and whatnot. Can you talk a little bit more about what that, like, I've never heard that term before. Um, can you talk more a little about what, what that is and maybe some coping strategies for managing yes. and working through it? Yeah. So, you know, I, as I think about it and I listen to your question, I'm realizing that it's not an either or, it's a both and. So yeah. what, what I mean by that specifically is that, yes, this collective trauma is happening to all of us in the world. Um, and you're right. Uh, when you have friends or family um, who are affected by, like, say, for example, the restaurant industry closing down or schools being closed, um, some people might experience, you might experience some feelings of guilt that you can work from home and still make a living and not have some of the same challenges that other people have. So vicarious trauma is more like, it's sort of like next to trauma, if you will, because I know it's happening to you and that concerns me. And then when we experience vicarious trauma, sometimes we feel really sad, we don't know why. Or we feel really angry and we don't know why. Or we feel really worried and we don't know why. And um, so I would say that both, both the collective and the vicarious um, are probably affecting you, for example. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, absolutely, it, it makes sense. Are there, are there particular, yeah, like coping strategies or ways, ways of uh, dealing with that that, that you've seen be successful or that you can suggest? Well, I mean, one of the first things that's really important is to, um, identify and name what you're experiencing. And sometimes that actually involves being quiet and just checking in with yourself and what's arising for you emotionally. Um, because in our culture, uh, I can't speak for other cultures, but in our culture, we definitely value, you know, stiff upper lip. Um, you know, I think there's a subculture in the U S of, you know, you go to work when you're sick cause you're tough and, the toughest people work hard and they show up and they're not wusses. So um, <laughs> I think there's a certain amount of pressure, for example, for people to go to work when sick. And um, so I think the first thing is really identifying kind of what you're experiencing, what you're thinking and what you're feeling, because that'll give you clues into how you're affected by this. Right. 
Thank you, um, panelists. And if, if someone's on tonight who has a really, really big question and they didn't get a chance to ask or they didn't want to ask out loud, um, just feel free to get on the ECHOES website, echoesbellingham.org. Send us the question and we'll get it to Jenny or Josh. So echoesbellingham.org, feel free to drop us a line with our contact um, little link there and we'll, we'll be happy to do that. So I'm incredibly appreciative to both Josh Whaley and Dr. Jenny McLaurin for joining us tonight. Um, and everybody <laughs> continue to wash your hands and to do social distancing and get rest and uh, exercise and take care of yourself as we all try to do this together, as we try to have compassion for one another, as we try to get through this as a society with the least amount of damage, because we know the bigger damage is still on its way. So thank you so much, bless you, and may you be good to yourself and to others. Thanks, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. With you. Thanks. Good to see you, Josh. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. All right, good night, everybody. Bye.